20 minutes later, I resorted to actually crawling on my belly as the scrub was shorter on this drier, leeward side of the hill. Because of the heavy plant growth, I could not crawl while holding my weapon, so it was slung next to my backpack. I was sweating in my suit as its thermal masking features were operating at maximum. The insulated heat sinks in my thigh bulges were warming fast and I would have to do something about them soon. With luck, we would have the same foggy conditions tonight as we did last night. But even if fog did form, it would likely not arrive for at least four more hours. The good news was that the dark skies were mostly cloudy and there were many long periods where direct satellite observation was limited. As I slowly continued crawling, I passed an opening in the vegetation which allowed me a long view to the north of the island. I saw lights far away. They had to be coming from the launch facility. I had not seen a large grouping of lights in the night since, well, since back before Earth was destroyed. The sight of them struck me. I toggled the goggles lenses to the highest magnification and spent a moment observing the distant island. There were plenty of lights, but far fewer than if it were a human manned facility. I ran the goggles through the spectrum and found the distant base was much brighter in the thermal ranges. I guess the mobile units and equipment there did not rely on vision so much as other sensors. I recalled seeing the same thing back at Agent's secret underground submarine manufacturing facility in Kings Bay. The assembly areas had been very dark also. The distance was too great and my goggles too weak to make out fine details, but I could clearly make out the large grouping of curved roof buildings. They resembled military or farmer's Quonset huts, but were hundreds of meters long. There were dozens of the buildings and they were all connected to a much longer perpendicular structure. This longer structure was enormous and must have been 200 meters wide by nearly a kilometer long. One end of the huge structure ran right up to the cliffs on the east edge of the island. Where it ended, a long causeway extended out into the ocean at least a half kilometer. The end of the causeway was the location of the launch pad and it was a beehive of activity. I watched as what appeared to be ants crawled back and forth up and down the causeway. The long, large building must have been the final assembly line for the launch vehicles. For a moment, the activity made me worry that a launch might be happening soon. But when I focused on the launch structure, I could not detect a launch vehicle of any size standing on the pad. Either it was a tiny rocket or it had not been brought out of the factory yet. I got back on mission as there would be time later to inspect the base. Hell, if Lady Luck graced me once again, I might get to go there and see a launch up close. I resumed my slow crawl. I was now on the other side of the hill about 20 meters from the summit clearing and approaching the area north of the installation where the power and data cables should be located. I stopped and slowly rose up enough to risk a glance at the tower. Wow, they look close. I felt extremely vulnerable, and when I resumed my slow westward crawl, I mimicked an inchworm and hugged the ground. Time, I subvocalized. 22.05. I kept crawling. Ten minutes later, the tablet spoke up. The cleared path which extends down the hillside and which contains the power and date conduits is ahead two meters. Please ready the tap device and wait for the Ricky unit to approach. I slowly rolled to my side and carefully wiggled out of my backpack. I rolled back to access its contents. From the side pouch, I found the cable tapping device. It was small, about the same size as my canteen. It was also irregular with a rock's color and texture. I inspected it quickly but it looked just like a rock except for one small protruding pull ring. What was hidden under the rock-like surface covering was an incredibly complex mechanism, a true miracle of technology and miniaturization. Whether it worked as Naomi had designed meant the difference between my getting off this hill alive or getting zapped, blown up, or skewered by some enemy unit. Ricky nudged my arm, startling me. I had not seen it quietly approach from cover. I linked to the bio unit for a moment, allowing the tablet and my watch to coordinate the next few minutes with the mongoose. Soon it crawled to where I had set the tap downs, latched on to the pull loop with its teeth, and began to drag the tap over to the power and data conduits. I crawled ahead another half a meter so I could keep him in sight. He managed to pull the tap over to one of the conduits, which was exposed just above the soil. I noted that the clearing had no plant growth of any kind. The enemy units must periodically apply a defoliant or herbicide of some sort. 
I hoped the tablet would warn me if there were airborne or ground toxins in the area. Ricky slunk back, leaving the tap on the conduit. I saw the small device wiggle slightly as a panel on its underside opened and it began to work on the tap. I imagined it doing what Naomi had told me it would. This was to carefully cut open a section of the conduit's casing, expose the data link inside. It then would carefully splice in a bypass loop. Once that was done, it would then cut the main data fiber and insert a small tap module in line with the existing cable. It would finish up by sealing the conduit. Ricky moved in again and began to drag the tap device back to my location. I saw as it did this, a tiny new cable trailing behind. When the tap was back under the cover of the undergrowth, Ricky returned and carefully buried the new cable a few centimeters underground where it had been exposed on the open ground. While the mongoose did that, I set about hiding the tap control processor module here by burying it also. The module would continue to operate for months until it ran out of power. What it did was intercept the signals between the hilltop installation and the launch facility below in Baltra Island. The module was semi-intelligent. If certain information were sent, such as a detection warning about me or a request to investigate strange happenings on the hilltop, the module would act to sanitize the message. Hypothetically, I could stand up right now and dance around being noticed by the sensors at the installation above, while the enemy AI presence at the base below would be none the wiser. The sensors up here would pass on the message and receive the appropriate reply through the buried cable. This proper reply would prevent the hilltop processors from sending a follow-on warning by open radio. That was the theory anyway. The only problem was that there was no way to test this safely, so I would continue to act as stealthy as possible. Now we had to tackle more equipment. There were the wireless transmitters, which included a microwave antenna directed at the base below, and also a satellite antenna focused on the heavens above. For those, I had more taps. Naomi had identified which of the equipment modules up here were the control processors for both transmitters. Luckily, there were just two. The phased array radar and the tracking optical sensor scope also had processors which we would need to isolate. All four of these devices would need to be tapped and placed under Naomi's control. Fortunately for me and for Ricky was that all four of these processors were mounted on the ground in small enclosures. This meant that the mongoose would be able to approach them all, dragging the little taps. The taps would intercept the data line conduits outside the cabinets, similar to what we just did on the North Face. I set about working my way closer so the mongoose would not have to drag the rock-like devices too far. Ten minutes later, I was now less than ten meters from the two towers. The plant growth stopped here and I could clearly see the ground-mounted enemy equipment. This was close enough and I laid all four taps on the ground and sent Ricky off to place them. Forty minutes later, we were done. The mongoose had delivered each tap to the conduits at each of the equipment cabinets and soon returned trailing a new data cable. I connected the ends of the four new cables to a tap controller device which I hid under a few rocks. Ricky then went back and began to hide the new cables leading to our controller. I took a deep breath. I really did not want to do what I was about to do. With my flechette gun in hand, I stood up and exposed myself to the enemy installation. I'd know in moments if the taps were working as designed to filter out the urgent report and instructions which the two processing units were desperately trying to send to the enemy AIs at the base below or up into space. If everything was working as intended, the taps would be stopping the outgoing messages and returning stand down instructions as a reply. As I stood there, I watched both the tracking camera and the distant base lights below. If either the camera mount started tracking towards where I was standing, or if an aircraft suddenly took off below, I was dead. Any new emissions detected? I asked. No new emissions either from this installation or from the base below are being detected. No satellite transmissions aimed at this location detected. Perimeter search and weather, radar operating as normal. Phased array, not operating. I felt dizzy from the sudden relief I felt upon hearing that. The taps were working. I would live a bit longer. I wanted to shout my defiance and dance a jig in celebration, but I had work yet to do. Now that we had muted and muzzled the enemy processors up here on Cerro Crocker, I had to call for an airdrop. From my pack, I found the microwave communication attachment for my weapon. 
The tablet helped me aim the directional transmitter toward the microwave relay we'd installed on Gardner Islet a few days ago. Once I had the thing aimed correctly, it sent a burst transmission informing Naomi that we had completed phase one of my mission. A few seconds later, I heard via my goggles headband, well done, John. OMU is taking off now with the microwave relay equipment and related gear. It should arrive at your location in 95 minutes, plus or minus two minutes. Proceed with phase two. See you in a few days. Transmission terminated. In an hour and a half, a package would be falling from the sky. I set about getting ready. The first thing I did was dump some of the heat I had been storing. I got the small folding shovel and dug a hole a half meter deep at the south edge of the hilltop clearing. Into the hole, I dumped the insulated packs which contained the red hot heat sinks. After filling in the hole halfway, I spread a meter of thin foil over the area and then added more soil. The hot sinks would slowly radiate the stored heat away into the ground and the foil would limit the visible hot spot for a day or so until everything reached equilibrium. From my pack, I found the spare cool sinks and installed them into the thigh pockets. Next, I checked the time. It was 1.33. The airdrop would be here around 2.30 and that left us a few hours to safely get the microwave relay set up. I had an hour's worth of work to prepare so I got back to work. The next task was to connect a data fiber to the tap controller and string it off to the east 100 meters or so. This is where our microwave relay antenna would be installed and hidden. For power, the unit I'd be installing had a long-lasting battery, but we would also be stealing a trickle of power from the enemy conduit, so I attached an induction pickup along a meter of the existing power conduit and buried or hid the new power lead out to where the new relay would be located. Next was to bury or hide all that I could. When I was finished, I inspected my work. If the enemy showed up and did a detailed inspection, my work might have been discovered, but for anything less than that, we'd be fine. Of course, if they did show up and physically connected to any of the four on-site processors, the jig would be up instantly. Only after we took over the main AI below would these processors be rendered completely safe. In effect, our actions here were like a ticking time bomb. There was no real way of undoing the damage we'd done even if we wanted to. If we gave up and ran away, our actions here would eventually be discovered and the enemy AI would know we were out and about. Scorched Earth would follow. We had no choice but to continue onward. I checked the clock and saw that I had 15 minutes before the airdrop arrived. I gathered up my pack and quickly fed the biodrones. Ricky and Scoot were taking a deserved rest and Wilbur was still roosting for the night. I relocated my pack and weapon over to the south side of the hill. Now out of sight of Baltra Island, I used a small parasol as a sky shield and used a heat pack to make myself a cup of hot coffee. I had just finished the last of my coffee when the tablet reported that it detected faint emissions approaching from the south. I looked out and up and saw a black ghost-like parasail come floating down quickly from the southeast. Below the sail was a crate that contained the microwave relay and a mobile unit to help me deploy it. Omu had taken Habu up to near 15,000 meters before releasing the guided parasail to glide all the way to this island. I was amazed it arrived at all, even more so that it made it on time and on target. The seasonal trade winds were the key. One of the primary reasons Naomi had positioned Nautilus where she did was for just this reason. They were steady and predictable and at the higher altitudes blew strongly out of the southeast. The winds would be a key part of our plans to come. I wished Omu could have just flown the crate here in Habu, but operating the aircraft so close to the other base would have been too risky. And if she had parachuted herself here to help, she would not have had enough power for the long hike back to the mini-sub. Hopefully, the less capable mobile unit that was coming with the airdrop to assist would be up to the task. The crate landed in the foliage nearby, and I set about gathering up the parasail. I was careful to limit the amount that I disturbed the plant growth, but some still got trampled. I opened the crate and let the mobile unit deploy itself. It was a many-legged unit about the size of a big raccoon. From the crate, it picked up the microwave relay and followed me over to the location I selected to install it. While it installed three anchors into the ground, I stowed the parasail in the now empty crate and hid it some distance away. When I returned, I helped finish the installation by mounting the microwave horn on top of the anchor struts. The unit powered up and aligned itself with the distant relay over a hundred kilometers to the southeast. 
The mobile unit connected the power and tap data fiber to the microwave controller. The link up between the two relays must have been successful as I heard. Well done again, John. The microwave signals are being exchanged at a sufficient rate to allow high bandwidth communications as needed. Also, I am accessing the taps and now have limited access to the enemy network on the island below. Finish up the installation and begin to make your way back home, John. I will have a fine meal and a warm bed waiting. As the mobile unit and I worked to hide the relay with a camouflage tarp and transplanted foliage, I thought about what Naomi had said. It was spooky to think that it was in limited contact with the enemy's network. I hoped she was being careful. Up until now, we had only intercepted satellite communications and had not had direct access. I was excited at the success we were having so far. The other thing I thought about was her wish to have me back safe. I was surprised at how touched her statement had made me feel. Again, I wondered at the capabilities of this artificial thinking being. I wanted to be doubtful, but I was beginning to realize that they were not just machines. There was something more involved. Maybe not a soul, but something important and unique nonetheless. The fog had finally arrived, and I was able to unseal my stealth suit and cool off. The mobile unit and I completed our installation, and I packed up my gear. We had two hours until dawn, and we wanted to be as far away from here as possible before we had to stop. My going was much easier now for two reasons. The first was simply that walking down a hill used less energy than walking up. The second was that I made the mobile unit carry the heavy backpack. Say what you will. Feel free to call me exploitative, but a dummy I was not. The unit was mine to use, and I used it. It had just enough power to continue operating until dawn, and then it would be left behind and hidden, so why not use it while I could? A few hours later, we stopped for the night, and I set up camp. We had made it more than six kilometers towards the coast and were currently under the canopy of the dense grove of Scalacia trees. That thick canopy meant I had much more freedom to wander about, and I enjoyed this bit of downtime. I found a nearby pool of clear water and gave myself a decent bath. When I was dry, I relaxed to a hot meal of reconstituted eggs and a package of biscuits. The two larger biodrones went out and about to scout the area with little scoots staying put. The nearly depleted mobile unit had been hidden earlier in the bottom of an old sinkhole. I sat there by the tent reviewing the mission on the tablet and caught myself yawning. Soon I was sound asleep in the cool shaded tent. It was after three o'clock the next morning when I finally limped onto the old wharf at the narrow harbor of the old city of Puerto Ayora. When I say limped, I mean that literally. My right leg was forced rigid and straight by the improvised splint I had managed to attach a few hours before. I was in pain, although it was a dull pain due to the meds I had taken from the medical kit. Ricky arrived behind me and circled around the area, nervous about my plight, I imagine. When I found a ledge high enough so that I could easily sit with room for my leg, I held out my hand for him to approach for a quick link up to the smartwatch and tablet. When that was complete, I used my goggles to search the harbor's flat waters until I found the tiny intermittent firefly flash of the small communications buoy, which the mini-sub had left. It was about 20 meters away, so I used the communications attachment on my flechette gun to signal to it that I had arrived. The mini-sub had left the buoy here while it waded out in deeper waters, but was still in contact via an underwater data link. As I waited for the sub to make its way back into the narrow harbor, I thought back to my stupidity from earlier. Still buoyant from the success of the previous day's mission, I had been merrily making my way back to the coast a bit too fast and had missed spotting a small sinkhole in my path. Of course, I had slipped off its edge and fell. That was bad enough, but what was worse was that as I was falling, I caught my leg in a tangle of roots near the bottom and had dislocated my knee. It was a good thing that we had earlier been successful in taking control of the equipment on top of Cerro Crocker as my shouts of pain would have likely been heard the 10 kilometers away, or they might have later detected the noise of my weapons fire as I used it to shoot the larger roots apart in order to free myself. Thank God it had remained attached to the pack when I fell and that it was still functional. Wilbur and Scoot had survived, though they were probably shaken up from the tumble. Ricky had been scouting ahead and had returned to find me when I had yelled. He had milled around anxiously as I worked to extract myself from the mess I was in. When I had gotten my leg free, I linked with Ricky and had the tablet instruct him on how to pull loose the medical kit from the side pouch of my pack. 
He was successful, and I managed to get myself dosed with a strong painkiller soon after. Then it was a matter of dragging myself up the side of the sinkhole. I attached the makeshift splint after first checking to see that I was not bleeding, nor had any protruding bones. The leg was clearly fucked though, and I prayed that I had not torn an artery. I tried walking and only made it a few dozen meters. I needed a crutch and set about cutting a piece of wood to a useful size. Fast forward the next four hours as I used the makeshift crutch to limp slowly down the final kilometer to the water's edge. Thankfully, I had made it with enough darkness left to board the mini-sub right away and get the hell out of here, as having to camp another night would have been bad. Two hours later, I was passed out lying in the bottom of the mini-sub. If I had known how hard it would be getting myself into the sub with a bum leg, I would have just pitched my tent and sent the mini-sub home alone. They could have then sent Habu to retrieve me with a pod, so I could have left the splint on. Oh well, live and learn. Now to keep living. I was now wet and clammy cold as I had skipped changing into the wetsuit. I had a bit more room as I had left much of the pack's contents behind. Wilbur had stayed behind also after having been fed and told to fly back to the area where Nautilus was waiting later in the coming day. I had even left my trusty weapon behind as there was no one left to pry it from my cold dead fingers if we had a mishap during the voyage home. My knee was absolutely throbbing. Every movement caused a new explosion of pain. In the cramped and wet conditions of the sub, I would hold out as long as possible before a cramp or numbness caused me to have to reposition. That would cause the knee to flare up even worse. I dug through the medical kit and found the stronger pain meds. I had been warned that these would knock me out, so I made sure the sub and the tablet could get us home. It was a risk, but I'd had enough. Soon I felt the cool, blessed relief of the pain fading away. Consciousness soon followed, and I was out. I came to as the mini-sub clanked into its dock position. The pain in my knee flared just as strongly as before, and I muffled a cry in an expletive. Soon the hatch opened, and Omu crawled in carefully. What the hell did you do to yourself now, John? She asked. She began to scan my leg with a handheld x-ray device or something similar. I just continued to grit my teeth. Wow, that's a lot of damage. You are lucky that you did not tear an artery. She finished up her inspection of my knee and turned to face me. The damage appears quite severe. It will be simpler to activate one of the clone bodies and upload a copy of your most recent mind data into that unit. Since taking a current mind data scan now would be too painful for you, why don't you just verbally share with me any important thoughts, memories, or insights from the past few days before I terminate your current awareness? I will be sure to relay those thoughts to the new personality once it awakens, she said soberly. My face echoed my shock and horror through the pain. I was too stunned to react for a moment. Finally, my reaction to her proposal made it to my mouth. What the fuck, Omu? Her stoic expression failed at that point and she started laughing. You should see your face. Wait, I will show you the recording when you recover. Relax, you big baby. You will be fine. With that, she jabbed me with a needle. I cursed out loud again, but almost immediately the pain began to fade. I was still riled up and continued calling her choice names. The pain continued to lessen, but my awareness was fading with it. Time to go to sleep again. I realized I was lucky the pain was gone, as Omu had begun to use tethers to secure my legs together. She must mean to pull me feet first from the mini-sub. I attempted to speak to tell her to wait a minute longer until I was fully unconscious, but everything went dark before I could get my mouth to work. I woke refreshed as the medical crush lid began opening. The internal lights had been brightening as I came awake, so the brighter lights in the room beyond barely made me squint. Good morning, John 2.0, Omu said. Kiss my ass, I replied. I stretched and felt a twinge in my knee. It was not a sharp pain, but more of an achy, stiff feeling. I carefully bent my leg up and was happy to feel just a bit of soreness. Your knee has been repaired and it is again functional. The soreness and stiffness will linger for a day or so. Do not attempt heavy exercise, excessive running or jumping for at least two days. Please stop at the registration counter on your way out. I sat up and saw that she appeared to be wearing a white coat. There was the image of a stethoscope around her neck. Despite myself, I laughed. I climbed out of the creche and looked myself over. 
My knee had a few faint lines which must have been where the machines had opened it up to effect repairs. I took a few hesitant steps. No pain? Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Omo. I'll gladly pay. How long was I out of it? I asked. It is currently 7.35. Today is Sunday. You arrived back here Thursday evening, two and a half days ago. I have breakfast ready for you in the salon. Later after my meal, Naomi gave me an update on what had happened over the past few days. I learned that the microwave link was working perfectly and that she now had limited access to the enemy data net in operation on Baltra Island. This allowed her to carefully monitor all the local AI presence's directives to its various mobile units, mining operations, and manufacturing facilities. Naomi also now had access to both radars and the tracking telescope sensor on top of Sarah Crocker. This was important as it allowed us to have a better idea of the upcoming weather and also knowledge of when the skies were clear of enemy aircraft. Our next phase of the takeover would depend on both pieces of information as we would be lofting our forces as soon as the weather conditions and the disposition of the enemy units in the area allowed. Our primary assault force of the 500 enhanced and modified bats would not be flying the 130 kilometer distance to the island. Well, that was not completely correct as they would be flying, just not under their own power. Making the flight by themselves would take far too long and use up too much of their stored energy reserves. Instead, they would be carried aloft by balloons and then be airdropped in pods to glide to the distant island. While that was going on, the second wave of our forces, the quadruped assault mobile units, would be delivered by Habu. The aircraft would use the conformal pods currently stored in the hangar hull to deliver the units to the battle zone. Before the bats were lifted by the balloons, Omu would deliver one pod full of ground troops to the water just northeast of Santa Cruz Island. There, a waiting long-range aquatic drone would push the pod the rest of the way to Baltra Island. Soon after, as the bats' pods were making their hour-long glide to the launch complex, Omu would fly Habu and a second pod load of assault units to the south face of Cerro Crocker and wait there on standby. At that location, she would be minutes away from the action. When the bats arrived and got busy performing mayhem, Habu would streak over the short distance and the second pod would be dropped on the target just minutes after receiving the go-ahead signal. Meanwhile, the aquatic drone would have delivered the first pod of troops to the launching causeway off the east coast of the island. There, they would make landfall and cover those approaches of the enemy facility. What would I be doing during all this? Well, that was currently the hot topic of discussion. Naomi was strongly urging me to wait here aboard Nautilus. I wanted to be on Habu with Omu. Her reasons were that Nautilus had a slight chance of escaping and evading the enemy if things do not go optimally. That was her exact phrase. I preferred more colorful phrases like Fubar or Tarfu. The argument continued. But Naomi, the AI's units at the base don't go around armed at right? I should be fairly safe until the base is secured. Correct, John. Aside from each mobile unit's deadly self-destruct charge, they are relatively harmless. There is only one longer range weapon that I am aware of currently on Baltra Island, which is, she began. Oh shit, I already knew where this was going. The 40 megaton compression fusion scuttling charge located near the primary processor and data facility. Well, at least buying the farm that way should be relatively quick, she continued. Although I suppose you could include the thousands of low yield fusion propulsion bomblets currently in inventory as weapons. I get your point, Naomi. Do you really think Nautilus would survive the scuttling charge going off? Yes, with the bulk of both Santa Cruz and Española Islands between the launch center and the distance from the center of the blast to our current position, this vessel should survive easily. The primary concern would be the follow-on detonations, which would likely rain down from orbit and saturate the area. And the master AI would quickly deduce that the attack on its facility here would likely be staged from a submersible vessel, she replied. Further, beyond that initial response, even worse could follow. A ring of nautical fusion mines could follow. These could be dropped across half the ocean and would remain patiently waiting to detect our passage. Until we were detected, the entire area of all the oceans on your world would undergo increased scrutiny from this time forward. All beaches, harbors, and coastlines would be intensely monitored. In short, our current relatively free seagoing lifestyle would end abruptly. 
That was sobering. I also quickly realized that with the enemy assemblage due to arrive sometime in the near future, the option of sitting on the bottom for a few centuries waiting for things to blow over was not an option. Assuming that the enemy machine would ever let things blow over after our provocative attack on one of its facilities. Naomi, that helps make my point for going along on the attack. If Nautilus is still at high risk and may not escape anyway, then I might as well be where the action is. Besides, if I die and you do somehow escape, you still have my clone backups. I want you to find some role for me so that I can help with the direct attack. She did not reply. I took that to mean I'd won the debate. 